an 8 to 10 centimeter oblique proximal medial to distal lateral incision is made just distal to the antecubital fossa. Subcutaneous dissection is carried out carefully. In the lateral aspect of the wound, the lateral antibrachiocutaneous nerve can be identified. Nearby veins should be ligated and a vessel loop placed around the lateral antibrachiocutaneous nerve. The nerve is then carefully retracted to the opposite side while dissection is carried out lateral to the brachial artery in the flexor pronator groove to identify the biceps tendon tunnel. In acute situations, the tunnel can easily and bluntly be separated from surrounding soft tissue, leading the examining finger directly to the biceps tuberosity. With supination and pronation of the forearm, the biceps tuberosity can be confirmed. A close-up view of the biceps tuberosity and full supination identifies it to have a large footprint where the biceps tendon inserted. The biceps tendon inserts on the ulnar side of the biceps tuberosity, giving it a windless effect with supination and pronation of the forearm. Next, the Lacertus fibrosis is identified, which leads the examiner to the ruptured biceps tendon. Careful dissection below the subcutaneous fat allows for palpation of the biceps tendon, which can be withdrawn distally. If still attached, the Lacertus fibrosis prevents proximal retraction of the biceps tendon and ensures easy retrieval at the time of surgery. The tendon can be delivered onto a cotton gauze in preparation for suturing. A number five fiber wire suture is then placed in a locked baseball or crack hour stitch. Three or more locking loops are created, advancing distally towards the tendon end. A 9 mm endo button is chosen. The first fiber wire suture is then carefully passed through the medial holes of the endo button, leaving the lateral holes for the later marionette sutures. The number five fiber wire suture is then carefully passed through the opposite end of the tendon. At this point, it's very important to set the tension appropriately in the, on the endo button. An assistant can hold the endo button firmly while the suture is being passed. Approximately five millimeters of space should be left between the endo button and the cut edge of the tendon. A lock of suture is then made, securing the endo button at a five millimeter distance from the tendon end. The remainder of the locks are created and the first suture is firmly tied. At this point, a second suture is placed at approximately a 90 degree angle to the first suture using the number five fiber wire material. It's passed through the same two endo button holes and brought back along the opposite end of the tendon and sutured. In this fashion, two stout sutures have been placed through the tendon in a locking fashion and through the endo button, leaving a five millimeter gap to allow the endo button to toggle. The suture can then be cut and the tendon repair inspected. Zero Ethibon marionette sutures are then placed to help toggle the endo button. At this point, preparation of the tendon is completed and it's wrapped in a moist sponge for later use. The entire tendon is reflected proximally while the tunnel is then again exposed. 
Blunt dissection is carried out down to the biceps tuberosity and a curved cobra retractor is placed about the ulnar side of the radius to protect the medial neurovascular structures. The radial soft tissues are gently retracted, taking care to avoid excessive traction on the radial nerve. At this point, Henry's recurrent vessels are identified. I find it helpful to use medium hemoclips to ligate these vessels. With supination and pronation, the biceps tuberosity is again identified in preparation for drilling. A portion of the tendon can sometimes be identified on its ulnar aspect. The tunnel for the biceps fixation will be created nearer to the ulnar margin of the large biceps tuberosity footprint in an attempt to restore the windless effect of the biceps tendon on supination. A guide wire for an anterior cruciate ligament cannulated drill is then placed on the ulnar aspect of the biceps tuberosity with the arm held in full supination. It's drilled just to penetrate the posterior cortex of the ulna. An 8 millimeter anterior cruciate ligament cannulated drill is then chosen based on the measured diameter of the ruptured tendon. The drill is then advanced along the guide wire to drill only the anterior or near cortex of the radius. It's extremely important to protect the posterior or far cortex of the radius at this time. Meticulous removal of all generated bone debris is performed at this time and a thorough irrigation should be carried out. The cannulated 4 mm endobutton drill is then chosen to drill the posterior cortex of the radius over the guide wire. The drill is advanced just through the posterior cortex and stopped to prevent injury to any posterior structures. The cannulated guide wire is then inspected. Its distal end has a slot for passage of both looped marionette sutures. Guide wire can then be bluntly passed through both the anterior and posterior holes drilled in the radius. With the arm held in full supination, all retractors are removed, the elbow is flexed, and the wire bluntly advanced to exit subcutaneously one centimeter ulnar to the subcutaneous border of the ulna. It's partway drawn through the skin, leaving sufficient wire anteriorly to retrieve the marionette sutures. At this point, both suture loops are passed through the cannulated drill slot in preparation for biceps tendon passage. The guide wire and the loop sutures are then pulled through. Traction on the loop sutures draws the biceps tendon down towards the biceps tuberosity, and the assistant helps guide the tendon into the 8 mm anterior hole. The end of button is drawn through the posterior hole, and toggling is then performed to ensure that it's free on the far side of the radius. At this point, brisk tension on one of the two marionette sutures toggles the end of button into position. Release of tension ensures that the end of button lays flat on the posterior cortex. Anterior inspection is then carried out to be sure that the biceps tendon has been delivered into the anterior hole. The tendon can be seen here well within the anterior hole of the radius. It's important that the biceps tendon be advanced into the hole to ensure adequate contact with the anterior periosteal surface of the radius so that healing will occur. Tension on the biceps tendon at this point easily flexes and supinates the elbow. Fluoroscopy should be performed to confirm the button position on the posterior cortex of the radius. At this point, final irrigation is carried out, the vessel loop removed from the lateral endobrachiocutaneous nerve, and a subcutaneous closure can be performed. Stereostips may be applied over the wound along with a soft dressing, and rehabilitation commenced within three to four days of surgery. Most surgeons prefer to release the tourniquet prior to final closure to ensure a bloodless field. A drain is optional. Rehabilitation can commence with active extension and passive flexion exercises through a full arc of motion immediately. At approximately four to six weeks post-op, active flexion and active extension exercises within the confines of comfort are performed. Any residual flexion contracture is overcome with therapy. Strengthening is generally begun at eight weeks post-op with general resistance progressing then to full resistance at 12 weeks. 
Full participation in sports and heavy work is delayed until 16 weeks post-op. It should be noted that supination and pronation is best performed with the elbow in full flexion during the first three to four weeks post-op to avoid excessive tension on the repair.